Hello everybody. A very warm welcome to all of you to tonight's Expert Talk, the second digital Expert Talk. I'm very excited to see many of you here tonight and I hope you've had a very good week so far. So what is the HHL Expro Talk and why are we doing this? The HHL Expro Talk is a virtual talk series with which HHL aims to address key topics in research to broaden a knowledge transfer on current social, economic and political topics led by HHL experts. Now to briefly introduce myself, um, my name is Secret Fischer and I am delighted to be moderating the HHL Expert Talk series. I studied journalism and psychology at the Indiana University in the US and continued with a master's degree in performance psychology at the University of Edinburgh, where I also worked later on. I'm now responsible for the alumni network here at HHL. So before we're heading into tonight's second HHL Expert Talk, I want to give you a brief overview of HHL's facts and figures. Most of you already know HHL was established 120 years ago in Leipzig, and it is our mission to educate entrepreneurial, responsible and effective business leaders through outstanding teaching, research and practice. We're driven by excellence to benefit our students, stakeholders and society. So where are we today? Today we're excited to have more than 700 students in our five programs. The five programs are the full-time and part-time Masters of Science and Management, our full-time and part-time MBA, as well as our PhD program. We're proud to have more than 60 nations represented within our student body and to have an active network of more than 2,500 alumni spread over 10 chapters. We're obviously very, very proud that more than 300 startups were founded or co-founded by HHL alumni, and five of these are even unicorns. So privately held startup companies with a value of more than 1 billion US dollars. We're also very proud to say that we have strong bonds to more than 130 partner universities across the world. So now it is my great pleasure to introduce our second expert, Professor Dr. Carsten Bartsch, who will be speaking tonight. Carsten studied business administration in Saarbrücken, Midland and Washington DC and completed his PhD in marketing in 2001 here at HHL. He currently serves as Vice President, Director of Business Programs and Professor for Marketing and Strategy at HDBW, Hochschule der Bayerischen Wirtschaft in Munich, where he was, founding, where he was a founding member of the academic as well as the management team. He has a strong background in international management consulting and as well as as an executive executive trainer for multinational firms specialized in the fields of marketing strategy and digital business modeling. Currently, he is managing. He's a managing partner of DBNP, an internationally operating management consulting platform. He's also a co-founder and a VP marketing for Vesto, a Silicon Valley based startup focused on secure digital asset transfer solutions for the financial industry. It is my great pleasure now to hand over to Carsten, who will be guiding you through tonight's talk. So please enjoy. Well, thank you everybody uh, for uh, having me to in tonight's talk and for having me be the HHL experts, uh, expert for tonight's talk on um, Corona and digital disruption. Well, you know, to be honest, that's a little bit the tamed HHL, HHL title. I called my uh, speech for tonight a little bit different. Uh, I called it Let's Challenge the Ivory Tower, or in other words, which would be more like me disrupting academia. So, I mean, that is really combining two of my great interests and two of my character traits, so to say. On the one hand, I'm, in a, tr I'm a troublemaker. I love disrupting industries and thinking about disruption of industries. And on the other hand, you know, I've now been uh, a professor for more than 10 years after, you know, uh, a career in consulting before. So obviously, I always love to do in academia well, what I always do in my consulting business as well. I love to challenge. I love to question the way how we do things. And yeah, I would like to invite you uh, uh, on a journey with me tonight to uh, see how we can, you know, challenge the comfortable seats in the ivory tower and try to disrupt academia a little bit. Well, 
you know, when we're talking about academia these days, you know, during times of uh, COVID-19 and everything, well, I don't know, you know, honestly, when I talk to my colleagues at the moment, I mean, they're, I mean, <laughs> they're not shy of superlatives, you know, they're talking about a revolution or a transformation in academia, and, you know, my question and my reaction is always like, oh, really? You know, is that all which we need, you know, what it takes for a revolution, I mean, to do a class like this right now? You know, is this really revolutionary? I mean, hey, I love all my students there. A pick was taken a couple of weeks ago during a corporate strategy class at HHL. So, yeah, I mean, right now we're doing what we've previously been doing in a classroom face to face, being physically uh, together. Now we're doing that on Zoom or Microsoft Teams to just name two of the providers. Wow. And that is a revolution, really. I mean, just to give you an impression, this is uh, Anita Albers, a uh, co colleague from the Harvard Business School. This is Harvard X. You know, this is how Harvard does it. Uh, okay, it looks a little bit more you know, impressive, you know, having this auditorium really facing, you know, almost life size, all the participants, you know, look at the microphones and, you know, over here and the beautiful lights and all that. Yeah, that looks really cool. Also, the sneakers, you know, look really cool. Uh, Anita is wearing um, over here. But at the end of the day, this is a little bit more of technology, but is it really a revolution? You know, in my opinion, as a born troublemaker, as a disruptor, no. You know, this is doing the same business as we've been doing all the time before, as universities have been doing for hundreds of years, just using different means of communication. This is far away from a revolution. And quite honestly, you know, if we look a little bit beyond those revolutionary fantasies and look at the German academic reality, I mean, then um, it gets even more troublesome, you know, then we might be starting to think even a little more. I mean, uh, first of all, let's look at German universities or universities on a whole, you know. I mean, universities are pretty strange organizations. You know, on the one hand, you know, we are doing research to sort of discover how to solve the problems of the world in the future. You know, okay, good. You know, then we have found out how to solve the world's problems in the future. Then we tell our students how to solve the world's problems in the future. Then we do transfer to uh, companies, to the business world, and tell the business world how they should be solving the problems problems of the future and then it takes about 10 15 years until we discover hey hold on a second what we've been preaching for 15 years how to solve the problems of the future that might be interesting for ourselves to try out as well i mean that is a little bit of the knowledge hype cycle which we're currently or which we're typically observing in universities and you know when we talk about digitization now when we talk about how to be agile and all of that you know i mean hey you know we've been doing research on that we've been publishing on that we've been telling industry and students to do that you know to be digital to be agile but you know then let's look at the experiences you know <laughs> the, the the real life shock so to say of the present couple of, of the past couple of weeks you know Here's University of Heidelberg, University of Hamburg, you know, both of them having, you know, big troubles with teaching digitally. Hello, you know, this is Germany in the year 2020. You know, all of you are probably used to work, you know, all the time in your business environments using Zoom, Teams, WebEx or anything like that. But hey, now here's a big surprise. Sure, Corona was a surprise, but hey, uh, now we universities who've been talking about that all the time are, you know, forced to do that ourselves. And what are we seeing? We're seeing, you know, miserable disasters. You know, this one is my favorite here, and not only because I'm uh, currently sitting in Munich, but hey, Technical University of Munich just uh, got a uh, donation by BMW of 1 million euro to be <laughs> faster in digitizing their teaching. I mean, first of all, yes, it's always nice as a university to get a donation uh, of 1 million euro. Sure, no question about that. But second thought is, hello, Technical University of Munich. You know, a university that considers itself to be 
you know, at least one of the uh, best technical universities in Germany, if not in the world, or come on, make it the entire universe or something like that. And in the year 2020, they actually do need a million euro from BMW to be faster in digitizing their teaching. Germany, 2020. You know, the question is, hey guys, you know, what have you been doing in the past five, six, seven, eight years at least when digitization and communication became more and more uh, prevalent. So we see mm, that's a little troublesome. You know, we uh, like to talk about things, but doing things, uh, you know, is a little difficult for us. You know, um, some universities say, and many believe that, say, oh, yeah, Carson, you know, you're putting the wrong measure here. You know, why? Because I mean, universities should not be measured on, you know, how they're impacting industry or how they themselves are managing those kinds of, 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 of new technologies. No, the role of universities is to uncover new topics. I'm like, okay, yeah, all right. You know, I have Google, you know, I can, I know how to use Google. I can do a little bit of research and what do I find? Oh, German universities are on the top of the world. Unfortunately, only in ancient history and theology. I mean, don't get me wrong, you know, nothing wrong with ancient history and theology on great topics, you know, great subjects, you know, but I, I don't know about you, but I'd, I'll feel a lot more comfortable if I saw, okay, German universities are top of the world in artificial intelligence, in digital business modeling, in coding, in big data, in you name it, you know, all of those topics. But hey, I mean, you you can choose, you know, so um, we've got to be happy with ancient history and theology, uh, I, I guess, you know. At the same time, what do I see? Hey, you know, there is a um, there is a, a new university uh, being founded focusing entirely on artificial intelligence. Oh, that is good, you know. Uh, unfortunately, that university happens to be in Abu Dhabi. You know, it's not in Germany. Whereas at the very same time, here in Bavaria, we're starting a new technological university in Nuremberg. You know, just to give you a thought, you know, that is about, you know, probably 15 kilometers away from another technical university, um, which is uh, Erlangen, you know, which is uh, one of the leading technical universities uh, as well. So, yep, we are just uh, setting up a new university. Uh, yeah, we are, you know, our measure is, yeah, we are trying to be better than Technical University of Munich, which the same state owns, by the way, you know, um, but instead of, you know, looking to Munich, maybe we should be looking to Abu Dhabi and we should be looking to China and we be should be looking to the Silicon Valley and we should be looking to what are really the topics that are driving the world because this, this uncovering new topics you know, maybe I maybe it's me and maybe I'm a little negative, but that doesn't really seem to work uh, too well. So um, if we talk about this status quo, which, you know, honestly is probably everything else, but promising and cheerful and everything to to uh, try to understand that and, and take this status quo and look into the future. Where should we be going, Carson? You know, you're just like a journalist, you know, you're just, you know, complaining all the time and uh, uh, make recommendations how we can do better. Well, let's first try to understand um, what a university 4.0, you know, like it was uh, uh, announced in the LinkedIn post, what a university 4.0 could be all about. I mean, a university that is user-centered, industry convergent, you know, that that really has research and education stretching across institutions and is attracting the brightest minds uh, uh, ever in order to really be pushing new topics and to uh, contributing to, I don't know, the business world and the technology world just being better and doing better. Well, University 4.0 is not just, I don't know, a sexy term right now because we're talking about Industry 4.0, but if we look 
uh, along the evolutionary stages of universities, we we see there is something like University 4.0, which could be the next uh, sort of wave and the next, yeah, I mean, let's use the term, the next business model and the next organization model uh, of an organization uh, of a university in the future. I mean, we did have the University 1.0. I mean, the University of the Scholars, you know, we're talking about the Middle Ages, we're talking Charles University in Prague, we're talking universities, you know, that were, um, that we're teaching in Latin, uh, a little bit of trivia, you know, Leonardo da Vinci, you know, uh, who uh, probably was not the dumbest guy around, you know, never made it to become a university professor because he uh, didn't learn Latin until the age of 52. And he taught Latin to himself uh, because he felt it was important. But, uh, you know, this was the time of the University of Scholars in the Middle Ages, you know, then it took quite a while. Uh, for University 2.0 to pop up. University 2.0 was the time when all of a sudden, you know, those, you know, very much fundamentally research and thinking oriented uh, uh, universities realized, hey, you know, there's something like practical troubles in life, which we should help, you know, solve. And you know what? One of the first universities of that type was actually our good old HHL, our Handelshochschule in Leipzig. You know, why? Because in 1898, you know that Leipzig was a trading center in the world. And um, so the people who were doing the trades, you know, they they needed some skills. They needed to know about calculation. They needed to know about, you know, traveling, transportation. They needed to know languages. They needed to know law, contract law and all those kinds of things. So in contrast to the universities of scholars where we sort of uh, used to research the big thing, you know, economy and how economies and states are being financed. You know, um, HHL was founded as a university for trade. You know, nowadays we probably say as business school, you know, which picked up on the very current, you know, challenges uh, of uh, uh, its surroundings. Uh, then it again took another 60, 70 years until universities made a breakthrough, uh, a, a breakthrough um, analysis and a breakthrough discovery. They realized there is life outside classrooms. Wow, you know, this was great. You know, universities realizing that there's actually something happening left and right of the university, that we can collaborate with something called the business world out there, that we can do research together, that we can in involve, you know, companies and company representatives in teaching, that we can use corporate resources, labs and all that kind of stuff to do our teaching on uh, really high tech current infrastructure. Uh, so everything which we now know as, you know, standard stuff within uh, our university education, practical projects with companies, case studies, guest speakers, uh, and all that, you know, this kind of developed with the university 3.0. And I believe the next phase is going to be a, a university 4.0. A university which is very much like all the trends, all the developments that we are currently seeing in the business, in the corporate world, where universities uh, are developing as, as digital ecosystems without spatial or organizational uh, boundaries, uh, where universities can develop as something like like platforms, for example. I mean, we all know Flixbus, for example. We know that Flixbus is now the largest long distance bus transportation company in Europe. If we ask ourselves how many buses do they own, exactly one, you know, which is a, a banged up eight seater or something like that parked in a barn, you know, last thing I know in up in Denmark, but they weren't really sure about that. And all the buses that we know, they are used by um, or they're being put into uh, into operations by bus transportation providers. You know, good. Everybody concentrates on what they do best. You know, Flixbus does, you know, uh, create a, a good user interface on their platform, does great data analytics and all of that. And that tells the buses exactly at what time they'll have to be driving from where to where, you know, wonderful, you know. So, um, 
when we see that working in the business world, and I mean, we have many examples of that. We have the Ubers, we have the Airbnbs, we have the Amazons, we have the Flixbus. We have in an industrial setting, a lot of what we call smart services, analytics as a service, security as a service, or whatever you name it as a service. So the question is, you know, if we see so many as a service, why shouldn't we have a U? UAAS, a university as a service, a university as a smart digital ecosystem based service. Uh, yeah, like I said, without any spatial or organizational boundaries. So um, why are we thinking about that? I mean, um, obviously all my bitching and whining in the beginning about the uh, current state of, of German universities. Let's try to look a little behind the scenes and uh, let's try to understand <laughs> academia and agility. I mean, come on, academia and agility, you know, when you first hear that sounds a little bit like a fairy tale, but uh, quite honestly, if you look uh, further into it, you see it's currently a, more, a horror movie, you know. So our big challenge as the one who are creative, who are in academia, who are digital, who are international, who are full of ideas, our challenge is how can we get a happy end to this, you know, current horror movie. Academia and agility, why is that so troublesome? Well, um, as we are seeing in the current crisis, mainly we're still dealing with analog operations. In other words, we have a classroom, there's a professor standing in the classroom, guy like me, you know, there's students facing me, students look at me, their eyelids are fighting, trying to fight gravity, you know, so that their eyes are, you know, staying up. And that's it. And obviously you are very much constrained to the place, to the time where I do give my class. And that's pretty much it. You know, we also have a very traditional understanding of our offering. You know, uh, uh, many universities uh, are still heavily theoretical, which is good because we do need theory as a basis. You know, um, what I'm always scared of is those people who understand uh, everything about everything, you know, and then, you know, just throw around buzzwords and everything. No, we do need a deep theoretical grounding. We do need the principle of scientific, of academic work, but we need to apply those skills that we have in order to, you know, solve the current problems uh, of the world. However, what we still do is we focus very much on, you know, degree courses when uh, Siegfried was uh, uh, introducing uh, uh, HHL, and that's no criticism. I could talk about my very own university just as badly, you know. Obviously, what do we do? We list, you know, the degrees that we are currently offering, and that's about it. Well, we'll look behind the scenes of this uh, traditional offering and whether that makes too much sense uh, in the future. Last but not least, what I think stands most in the way of university development at agility is that our activities are mainly driven and very much restricted to our own faculty. I mean, let's have a little bit of a, of a picture. I mean, how does a university normally tackle a new field, you know, a new academic field they want to work at. I mean, first of all, we need to hire at least two professors. OK, that process takes about a year and a half. You know, then those two professors have started their uh, uh, their uh, their work at the university. Then they will have to develop a new offering, a new degree course or courses of study or something like that. It takes another year and a half. So we're at three years, you know. And um, then obviously, if we're talking about a degree course, we still need accreditation, which takes another year. So we had four years. So four years after we identified a topic to be a hot topic to be, you know, followed up by us as a university, we can say, hey, uh, we're ready. Uh, I don't know. I mean, we're always talking about the VUCA world, about very dynamic environments um, which we are in. And you know, so we have to ask ourselves whether this is really the right approach because I mean the consequences are clear. You know, I build up a big faculty of a university, I mean, which is there, you know, it's essentially until they're uh, they they die or they retire, whichever is first, you know, and uh, obviously what they do is they look at 
you know, what are my skills? What is my subject? What I can do? And based on those, on those subjects, you know, we're, you know, continuing to develop our courses of study or uh, we're, we're offering, uh, we're starting to develop new courses of study. So we're very much resource focused instead of being, I don't know, technology and outside world mega trend focused, you know, the stuff that really matters um, in a, a, a VUCA world. So I, I think we can agree, but you know, I'm obviously open to discuss that afterwards. I think we can all agree that the agility of you know our university system is still somewhat limited. By the way, if some of you guys, you know, blood pressure is going up right now, and you say, "Hey, Carson, I would love to punch you," you know, um, obviously, what I'm doing here is I'm provoking. You know, I'm trying to be thought provoking because I think we need to challenge ourselves. We need to challenge our very own industry uh, as we tell it to the outside world all the time. We need to challenge our very own industry in order to come up with the sort of uh, next generation of university, University 4.0. And um, yeah, I think uh, uh, sometimes it takes it needs a little provocation. So uh, uh, don't build up too much aggression. And yeah, you know, I'm 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 free for you guys to to slaughter me afterwards. You know, in 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 the discussion. But if we go along right now, um, when we see all the VUCA challenges that we have, obviously an organization that is you know not very agile, that is limited in its agility obviously has also troubles adapting to all those VUCA challenges. So, hey, analog operations in university are meeting, you know, digitization, which is uh, happening all over the place, are meeting smart services, you know, which we see in industry taking place and being offered left and right. And, you know, universities still think they are sort of the best source of knowledge where knowledge already comes from the cloud, comes from the internet. You know, we'll be looking into all of those aspects in a little more detail um, in a minute. I've prepared some numbers for you guys and you'll see that, no, I mean, the idea of a university being the unique source of knowledge, yep, that might have been there 1782, uh, Charles University, and, and, and still also, you know, uh, 1902, uh, HHL in, in Leipzig. But right now, you know, this is 2020 and technology and the world has continued uh, to turn just a bit. You know, um, the traditional offering of degree courses and, you know, very much focused on on theory. Well, the trouble then is, is that nowadays our knowledge is so rapidly aging. You know, on the next slide, I have a little bit uh, 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 of an overview of how uh, uh, rapidly academic knowledge is actually aging and, you know, what actually the half life of um, knowledge in, in, in different areas uh, of our field uh, is all about. And last but not least, you know, when we talk about uh, when we talk about uh, static structures. I mean, everybody out there, we're talking about flexible business models. We're talking about ecosystems. We are talking about hybrid, you know, business models. We're talking about platforms, all of the above. But, you know, we in the university, um, we are still the ones who are, you know, very much looking at these, uh, uh, at these classical structures. Uh, of uh, you know appointed professors who are there for a lifetime who are organized in 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 faculties and and and, and all of that um, as a young university and being part of the founder founding team of the university i was experiencing that and and when we are going through the accreditation process because i mean you would think that in the accreditation process you discuss contents and you know how is it going to be developing in the future and what are the target groups and how can you integrate external players and how to globalize that and all that no you know, the main concern you know in 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 accreditation processes is oh by the way you have a program director is that program director being appointed or elected and do you have a dean of faculty aside from the program director what's their position uh, holy cow you know 
I'm sitting there, I'm thinking like, guys, don't we have anything else than, you know, discussing bureaucracy? So the big question is, you know, we have a limited agility that is kind of keeping us away from adapting to the VUCA challenges that we have uh, out there in the academic world and in the business uh, world uh, in general. So what's the vision towards a happy end? How can we get flexibility and agility into the system of academia? Well, I told you, you know, I wanted to go into each of those, you know, sort of uh, uh, three main points, which I sort of uh, uh, labeled here as key problems. I wanted to look into each of those points a little more uh, uh, in a little more details, tackling the challenge of constraints in, in place and time. You know, unfortunately, I was only able to find a 2017 article, but that was interesting because it looked at the development of the so-called MOOCs, the massive open online courses. And you know what did we see from 2011 to 2017? 800 universities put more than 8,000 MOOCs online just before this article was written in November of uh, 2017 in the previous three months you know 200 more universities had added more than 600 uh, courses all of them or most of them free of charge so you know what we've seen you know quite a bit you know in the last couple of weeks you know we've seen uh, exponential growth curves you know this is not corona this time this is the amount how MOOCs you know are growing left and right by very prestigious uh, universities you know so constraints in place and time no i can literally be sitting you know close to the amazon river you know and as long as i have an internet connection you know i can follow a course at the harvard business school uh, whenever i want you know so there's no more constraints of of place and and and, and time um here is an example from from harvard x you know the uh, um digital uh, education platform of Harvard. And what you saw here, you know, the worldwide registration for Harvard X for their MOOC offerings. I mean, okay, you know, still, you know, more than 500,000, almost 600,000, or, or in total, more than 600,000 in North America, but almost 45,000 in Brazil, you know, uh, 17,000 Nigeria, 40,000 China, you know, Russian Federation, almost 20,000. So those are just a couple of selected countries, you know. Um, we can we can see here that already in 2014, Harvard X had more than 160,000, well, 1.6 million registrations from 195 countries of the world. So constraints in place and time, you know, forget it. You know, there's very much decentralized sources of knowledge which provide access to that knowledge to me whenever I want to have it. I mean, we've seen business models which are not new. The University of Phoenix, for example, in the US is one of the largest universities in the world with more than 400,000 students and only a small share of those are physically studying on campus. Most of those are doing long distance study programs and Boy, you know, I don't know how old the University of Phoenix is, or probably some, at least something like 25 years old or so. So even before the big wave of digitalization, you know, this was uh, taking off. So when we look at that, when we look at how big such decentralized universities like the University of Phoenix can get, if we look at how that growth, that development is being facilitated by MOOCs, if we look at you know the number of registration and the number of geographic coverage of Harvard X uh, uh, cover uh, of Harvard X offerings, um, then I think it is time for us to question our business model, which is still very much constrained in place and time and organization. Very often people say, yeah, Karsten, you know, come on, you know, you're talking about those MOOCs. You know, those MOOCs, you know, you can't compare them, you know. I mean, look at that, you know, only 6% of the people who are doing those MOOCs, you know, um, they actually earn a certificate, you know. So, come on, you know, this is, th this doesn't work, you know, because people never do it to the end. You know what? The point is, they simply don't care. You know, what they care about is they intend to, you know, audit a course. They might not even know yet whether they want to uh, 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 earn a degree. 
a very small number and tends to just uh, browse around. So yes, in the beginning, if you tell them, hey, you can earn a certificate, a lot of people will say, hey, yeah, I get a certificate from Harvard University. But at the end of the day, you know, what they say is great. You know, I, um, uh, uh, I have a great chance to access knowledge maybe to broaden my skills, maybe to broaden my skills with regard to tasks that I'm currently have to do in my job, you know? So at the end of the day, I don't care about the, uh, about the certificate so much, but what I care about is I care about my, you know, grown skill set, my grown toolkit, so to say, which I can apply. And, you know, that is way more important than, you know, having a, a nicely framed piece of paper uh, on the wall uh, at the end. And hey, you know, when we think about knowledge coming from the cloud, you know, this is something I just found last night. I found that interesting. Uh, and yeah, maybe we should be worrying about our classic business models. Here is, you know, Class Central on, 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 on Medium actually uh, proposed a MOOC MBA, an MBA entirely consisting of um, free of charge courses. You know, they give you the curricula, they tell you which courses to follow and all that, yes, I mean, at the end of the day, and this is why, you know, the MBA is written in the parentheses. Uh, at the end, you don't get an MBA degree, but, you know, here is the choice. You know, especially when you look at those universities here, here's your choice between getting a free MBA without a framed piece of paper or to get that, but to pay something like 60, 70, 80, thousand dollars for your program get yourself into debt and all of that so um yes i know that this are these are all great pedigree names that they are all part of our personal branding uh which is important you know no question about that but hey you know just this offering should make us think you know um how will our uh, our business models be developing in the future? When we think back to Amazon, you know, when Amazon started, a lot of the book big book retailers said, yeah, you know, a couple of guys will be buying their books online, but, you know, nothing major. Well, now, you know, Amazon is sort of a retail giant in the world. And uh, a lot of the uh, bookstore owners, you know, who didn't take Amazon for serious, you know, 20 years ago, now I have a lot of time because you know what? Because their stores went bankrupt and they can read their books, you know, on the corporate cemetery uh, of their former uh, bookstores, you know? So looking at that example, you know, it just shows us, you know, what appears to be a small niche right now might very well be developing into a credible competitive threat in the very near future. I'm not saying that, hey, uh, all MBAs are all masters of science and everything from, especially from universities like those ones here are becoming obsolete. But what I do want to challenge or what I wanna do put uh, up for discussion is to what degree uh, will that at least, you know, challenge the profitability, the number of enrollments by having those kinds of, 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 of MOOC uh, offerings. Well, another trouble, another challenge that we looked at was the challenge of outdated knowledge. And I told you, you know, we'd be looking at a, at a couple of examples of, of half-life. You know, uh, here's a, a graph which was published by IEEE uh, um, last year. And what do we see? Oh my God, you know, IT knowledge is, you know, aging in phew, less than two years, you know, professional expertise, technology knowledge, university knowledge still doing good, you know, if we're taking, you know, some kind of, you know, general kind of skills like academic work or how can you do lifelong learning by yourself? How can you challenge um, uh, academic positions and all of that? But we see that the core of what we are teaching, you know, the uh, uh, some of those you know, uh, skills and industry specific content, you know, they are aging so rapidly. So, uh, I mean, think about a guy who's doing a bachelor and a master's degree in IT and might be studying something like five years. Well, welcome to the world, you know, look at the uh, look at the curve and see how much is left 
from the knowledge that you've gained over your first year uh, of study. You know, so how can we as universities react to this rapid to these rapid developments in in, in terms of of content? You know. My idea is given the shortened life cycles of, of knowledge, you know, the relevance of those classical degree courses of study might slowly be decreasing, not overnight, not massively, but it might slowly be decreasing and we might be seeing that, hey, even for employers who are now looking at, you know, where did you graduate from? What were your grades and all that kind of stuff? Even those might rather be looking at, hey, what is it that you can contribute to my company? You know, and um, so when we move from a skill from a degree based system to a skill based system, we might be seeing new competitors, you know, such as consulting firms, such as, you know, specialized education providers in special uh, 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 industries or something like that. So we'll see a convergence and we will see the uh, academia universities losing their exclusive position, their protective posi position, which they've been having for, for quite some time. We'll see them losing that and yeah, you know, this is why at least my idea would be to have universities adopt their product and service portfolio to more flexible options of knowledge. For example, uh, offer MOOCs, you know, do something like an, I don't know, gold, a silver, gold, platinum model or something like that. Here's a course, you take the silver version, fine. You know, you get access to the MOOCs, you know, you get to do an online uh, exam at the end of the day uh, or at the end of the course. And uh, uh, then you get your certificate. Fine. You do gold. OK, you get access to your MOOCs, but you also have access to one weekly tutoring session or something like that. Digital tutoring session with uh, teaching assistants or, or uh, young professors or something like that. Platinum, I don't know. You do the Harvard X course. Uh, by Michael Porter at the Harvard Business School. And you know what? You know, at the end of the module, there's a one week in residence program in Cambridge, Massachusetts, you know, and you actually get to interact with uh, uh, with Michael Porter. So what do we see? You know, the uh, the uh, um, the silver model is extremely scalable, you know, and it can be available for relatively low cost. You know, even the gold model is still relatively well scalable, depending on my research endowment and the access to those uh, tutors and coaches. The platinum model, OK, that's the top of the crop then, you know. I mean, how often is Michael Porter going to do something like that? Maybe one week a year, uh, if at all, two weeks uh, a year. But that's it. So if you're going through that, you know, fine, you know, you're having a very exclusive position, you're having, you know, access to very exclusive knowledge, networking, you can exchange your ideas with the other participants, and you're probably willing to pay pretty high prices uh, for a course um, like that. However, if that happens, and you already saw my uh, example with Michael Porter right now, that means that also when we put people so much into the center of our offerings, we, we might see that a lot of the you know, branding, which traditionally is still very strong uh, on the university side, might actually be moving to the professor side or any other kind of lecturer. So, you know, it will be, in my opinion, my expectation will be a big competition among universities in the future to provide an attractive brand to their uh, suppliers, so to say, professors, lecturers, and ecosystem players. So, for example, as an institution of you know superior intellectual exchange for professors with industries and visionaries and other kind of uh, other kinds of of experts. So, um, last but not least, you know, let's look at the static structures uh, real quickly. You know, I mean, I think we all agree after what we've just discussed. You know, the source of the USP is not access to knowledge anymore. Knowledge is ubiquitous. You know, it can be gotten from the net, from the cloud, everywhere 24 7. You know, it is rather now the agility to identify the right topics early on 
to take those topics, to translate them into the most current curricula and the most leading research and you know business transfer considerations at the same time to create something like a perpetual mobile you know where you know every piece you know research transfer teaching is all kind of you know strengthening each other and for that you need the right people at the right time to do the jobs. I'm specifically saying not at the right place, you know, because places, as we've seen, are becoming more and more irrelevant. You know, places, uh, um, digital collaboration is so easy to do these days that we don't, that we're not even restricted anymore so much as we are still uh, right now to you know the faculty and the faculty colleagues that we have at our university but we could very easily uh, run a program for example which is a collaboration between a university in leipzig a university in shanghai and a university in san francisco or in the bay uh, in the bay area so, in my opinion, the, uh, the the key challenge to tackle the static structures is not to build up huge bodies of faculty, but it's rather to build up winning ecosystems in which the boundaries between universities, companies, visionaries, thinkies are are disappearing. You know, we have IT as the digital enabler these days for communication, for access to knowledge to uh, exchange experiences, to convey problem solving skills real time, to work on problem solving real time. However, you know, you know talking about this ecosystem approach, um, I'm aware of the fact that this might be difficult to achieve given the current academic regulation and legislation. I'm very sure that if I go to a Bavarian ministry these days and say, oh, by the way, I want to create a new university on artificial intelligence, and they'll be saying, oh, like, well, that is very cool. You know, how much money do you need? Um, well, not so much, a couple of hundred thousand euros. Uh, what? I mean, what do you think you have to pay for your professors? Oh, I won't have any professors. You know, I won't hire any faculty. You know, what? You know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, it, the latest after this sentence, they're going to crucify me, you know, uh, nothing else. So there's no way uh, around that yet uh, into those really hybrid kind of organizations with a very small institutional body in the middle and then a very strong and multifaceted uh, uh, ecosystem uh, around that. But hey, you know, what we see is when we're looking at the product and the service that we're selling is we don't need the classroom anymore to teach. You know, knowledge comes from the cloud is available everywhere. And yeah, as we've seen from the MOOC MBA, you know, potentially our existing business model is obsolete. I mean, OK, that's going a little far, but at least is severely uh, threatened. You know, when we think about the process, I think we have to uh, uh, we have to think way more about interaction. I know that we at HHL or we at HDBW as small young universities, we, we try to do that. But, you know, I would see that, you know, we would have to adapt our business model to become uh, uh, from a to move from a place of knowledge dissemination to a melting pot of experts, students, visionaries, corporates and everything who get together, share their knowledge, you know, uh, uh, look at the applicability of this knowledge and create new knowledge uh, through uh, the process of doing so. And that at the end of the day obviously also means that, you know, we as professors, we are no longer super spreaders or disseminated of, of, of knowledge. I mean, uh, knowledge, like I said, can come from everywhere. Our job when we're dealing face to face with our students, our job is, I don't know, I, I, I like to, to use the term personal growth coaches. You know, we are helping to, we are helping our students to grow, but we need to be coached. We need to grow as well. You know, so we need to play, we need to spread our wings, you know, in this ecosystem here and, you know, go back and forth with other partners um, that we have in the ecosystem and try to, you know, develop uh, our skills. You know, so we have a very much changing skill requirement. We're also no publication researchers anymore. Uh, and, you know, I've had a very personal experience. I was part of a PhD examination committee 
a couple of years ago at a European university. I'm not saying where it was. It was no German language university. And, um, you know, when we left uh, this uh, PhD defense, you know, one of my colleagues told me, oh, you know, Carson, you know, I think that we as uh, professors, you know, we shouldn't worry about solving the business world's problems. That's the role of the business world. I mean, our role is to uh, to uh, to teach our students how to work academically and to demonstrate that we know how to work academically. And quite honestly, my immediate thought was, hey, if that is the kind of job that you want, I mean, go do figure skating. You know, if you do figure skating, then you can show how good you can do something. But, you know, my idea is about business. We have to, yes, use our academic capabilities, our scientific work skills. But please, you know, we are the ones who have to bridge uh, the gap to the next big thing in, you know, whichever our field of uh, teaching and whatever our field of uh, academia is. And, you know, always keep an eye on applicability and, and, and relevance, you know, uh, for the world. And um, after I've just, you know, ragged on um, on Technical University of Munich in the beginning and with regard to their digital teaching, I now have to show them as a, in my opinion, best of class example. You know, they have created Unternehmer to them, which is their entrepreneurship uh, center. And they've seen that there's a couple of things which they can do uh, by themselves. You know, they can do, uh, you know, education and they can provide a co-working space, a little bit of prototyping uh, a workshop. They can do a little bit of accelerator and, 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 and consulting. Um, they can do a little bit of initial funding, but all of that is way too much to do it by yourself. So they said, OK, you know, if we want to create the best entrepreneurs, well, the best entrepreneurs are not just to be found among the students of the Technical University of Munich. They're also to be found at other universities uh, uh, out there in the world. And those universities, we have to make a part of our, you know, talent network, you know, same thing, you know, startup ideas don't just come from universities, they might also be coming from research institutions. So we have to integrate those into our into our ecosystem as well. Sure, I mean, we can provide a little bit of funding for companies left and right, but when we talk about the big money, you know, we need external venture capital partners to help us fund that. And at the end of the day, hey, you know, what is the ultimate test for a business idea? The ultimate test for a business idea is whether your partners or your clients, you know, accept it. So we need to integrate, you know, uh, a lot of companies. We integrate the business world into our ecosystem. And when you now go to Internematum out in Garching, you know, just by the uh, highway A9, A you know, going into Munich, when you walk in there, you know, it's fascinating. You see a lot of those, you know, corporate customers also doing workshops in there because they like the entrepreneurial uh, spirit in there. When they're doing workshop in there, hey, what are they doing? They're meeting all the people, you know, all the young entrepreneurs who are there. They're challenging each other. They are talking with each other, you know, funding and jobs and all of that is being discussed in, in situations like that. So obviously when you see, you know, such a great infrastructure on the capital and on the customer side. I mean, what's going to happen on the talent and on the technology side? Well, obviously, the best talents will say, Ooh, you know, this is really cool. This is where we need to go. On the other hand, the customers and the capital also know, wow, this is the melting pot of the best brains uh, uh, I can find, you know, so let's go there. Let's be a part of it. This is a sort of non-degree field. This is a very much of a niche field. But, you know, if we all start to think about our academic disciplines, if we think about how to push artificial intelligence, if we think about how to push robotics, if we think about how to push industry 4.0 digital business models, you name it, you know, and we could create an ecosystem, you know, which is mutually fruitful uh, uh, like this. You know, I think then uh, I think we're moving far away from the classic static structures that are very much inward and very much resource focused uh, as we see them in the universities uh, right now.
So that you've seen before, what could be a vision towards a, a happy end with flexibility and agility? Well, you know, I think we should be seeing education and academia really as a smart service with adaptive contents, with the most current curricula and research uh, agenda with our resources, with the brains, you know, coming from inside, but also from from outside the organization. And when we talk outside the organization, then obviously we're talking about hybrid business models, hybrid business models that are consisting of a lean and mean, very agile, small organization uh, in the core, but then surrounded by a diverse and flexible and multi-skilled uh, uh, ecosystem system you know when we achieve that we can see universities as personal growth spots personal growth spots by the way for students for industrial partners as well as professors because it's this kind of interaction um, that um, uh, that creates you know uh, growth and 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 brain teasers and i'm, I'm sure you know uh, those professors among you you agree that you know we never leave uh, we always leave a class smarter than we've entered a class because we've been discussing we've been challenged by our students and you know uh, that's wonderful so those personal growth spots i mean they can offer you know various types of of teaching, degree, non-degree, executive. They should be skill diverse. You know, they should be looking at the academics um, because they are the core. You know, this is what sets us apart. Somebody with an academic skill set and the uh, ability to work scientifically, this is what sets up apart to somebody who's just heard something uh, left and right. But we should also look at how to teach soft skills, how we teach, you know, intellectual curiosity, lifelong learning, because we know that a lot of the stuff which we are teaching our students will be outdated at least for uh, at most five years after their graduation. You know, so we also have to teach them how to how to think how to develop their own new toolbox, their own new tools, which were simply non-existent the time when they studied and graduated from us. So we need to inter integrate industry experts um, into the um, into the curriculum. We can have uh, uh, external faculty from industry uh, experts or even through MOOCs. You know, we can, why not integrating a course on from say Michael Porter or somebody else, you know, on, on, on certain topics into a curriculum of a university? Sure, I mean, I, I know that when we do that right now, again, our regulators, our legislators, they're going, go, going to go ballistic, you know, but, you know, we're thinking about the future right now. And uh, I, I think legislation and regulation also needs to be pushed. You know, and we also need to push that because otherwise, you know, we'll be taken over left and right by other non-university players such as uh, uh, training companies, consultants or, or something like that. I think research. So, you know, I've talking I've been talking about teaching quite a bit. Research, you know, is vital. You know, research is the integrated impulse, you know, and should have an immediate impact on teaching, on curriculum building, on industry transfer. And when we go into industry, well, what's going to happen? We're going to have the feedback loop back, you know, into our research, into our teaching, curriculum building and industry teaching. So ideally, we are building an, an e eternal uh, uh, loop back and forth between academia and the real world. Um, out there. So in short, I view University 4.0 as a melting pot of creative excellence, entrepreneurial creativity, future focus and industry expertise in an academic environment and of course deeply rooted in the uh, uh, academic tradition of scientific methods uh, and uh, work. Um, why am I saying that? Well, generally I think uh, this might very well be the future of the university. Uh, really, I mean, I'm, I'm not very doubtful about that. I mean, Alexa, please find me a course on, say, product management or something like that. And Alexa is going to know all my prof preferences from observing my daily uh, behavior because, I mean, at the end of the day, it's an AI-driven voice assistant and Google uh, and Amazon is currently planning 
to uh, um, establish Alexa as the one and leading uh, uh, voice control operating system. They are planning to put Alexa onto three to 350,000 to 350, additional non-Amazon products. So, hey, the question is not if we're going to have Amazon in our household five years from now or Alexa in our household, you know, five, 10 years from now. The question is in how many devices. So, yes, you know, uh, Alexa knows all my preferences and all my daily behavior. So it'll know that you know, I'll rather have a short course instead of a degree program. I want it to be in English. I want it to be very international. I want it to be very applied uh, in contact. And since uh, 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 Alexa also knows all my skills and all my, uh, my study background, why? Because it's an AI driven voice assistant. So it can uh, also uh, analyze uh, unstructured data in social networks such as LinkedIn or something like that. So uh, Alexa is always up to date about my skills, knows what I'm publishing, what I'm writing, what I'm posting, what my educational background and all of that is. So um, yeah, I think uh, uh, very realistically, I mean, all the technology is there very realistically. This could be uh, at least one future of university uh, uh, education and uh, yeah, I mean, my, my, my last quote is, you know, I love Albert Einstein, obviously being in Munich where he's been working in the patent office for a long time. Uh, um, you have to quote him uh, when you start. And Albert Einstein once, once said, if you do what you always did, you will get what you always got. And that we have seen in the current problems of the uh, academic system in the agility and digitization phase of Corona. So I think we will not continue to get this. So if we don't want to get uh, uh, what we always got, then I think we need to uh, uh, we need to change how we approach uh, agility in academia. I know I've been provoking, I know I've been painting the big picture sometimes, but you've also seen that this can be backed up by a lot of data uh, which is available uh, out there. So um, yeah, that was it uh, to begin with uh, for my provocation and now, you know, uh, I'm up for slaughtering and obviously I'm I'm up for discussion. Uh, thank you for your for your patience so far. And, you know, I'm I'm looking forward to to our discussion questions. Yeah, so yeah, first so of all, thank you very much, much Kaska, for the insightful, insightful speech. speech. I've read I've through read some, some comments, comments already. already. They were sure. saying enjoying your enthusiasm, Carsten. Well done and no questions, but thank you very much for really inspiring our providing a lot of food for thought. So first of all, thank you. And we're now taking questions and I will read out the very first one, Carsten. Here we go. One second. <laughs> uh, University of Phoenix is a for-profit university that has been sued for false advertising and taking mm -hmm. advantage of students. Yeah. OK. <laughs> Yeah, okay, uh, that was uh, just a comment uh, I read know, out. I'm, I'm not saying, you know, University of Phoenix should be a role model for us. I mean, there's a lot of things which have gone wrong at the University of Phoenix. There's been a lot of shady management people at the University of Phoenix. Absolutely. I totally agree. Uh, my main message about that is you can easily run a university which is not you know, centralized on one uh, uh, on one uh, uh, campus, which is not centralized in one location, and especially these days that we have all the uh, uh, all the uh, digital uh, uh, tools, all the uh, digital um, accesses to go uh, uh, all across the globe. Uh, I think that is an interesting uh, model to look at just in terms of the numbers. Please, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm not using University of Phoenix as a as a role model for academia or academic management. Uh, not at all. OK, thank you. So here's the first question. Many free MOOCs are amazing, but are typically very bad at engaging students in deep learning and supporting them to finish the course. Mm -hmm. How do business schools improve the MOOC model to reduce dropout, increase mm -hmm. engagement and application? Uh, if you ask me, you know, I personally think that uh, I personally agree. First of all, we see the uh, uh, low uh, degree of um, 
of uh, certificates of com and that is due to a low uh, degree of completion and that is potentially due to uh, the lack of interaction. So I'm personally a fan of, say, a combination of MOOCs pre-recorded, but then always have a significant portion of a digital course as an online live interactive um, session. This is not going to break uh, the constraints of time, but it's at least going to, to break the constraints of place because people and participants could at least be all over the place, or if they don't have time to join one discussion, it could be uh, recorded or so. But when we look at the three levels of disseminating knowledge, you know, one level is creating knowledge, the next level is creating understanding, the third level is um, creating uh, application skills. Um, I firmly believe that for, uh, you know, establishing knowledge, you know, we don't need to have a classic lecture where there is uh, no interaction uh, at all. You know, we can probably transport and communicate a lot of classic knowledge using MOOCs. But when it comes to understanding and application skills, I think we really have to go down to uh, down to the um, uh, interaction and more interactive, despite uh, yet digital formats. OK, thank you very much. So here's the next question. Dear Carsten, great speech, first of all. Do you Thanks. see specific areas of expertise where these ecosystems are very much the future or different perspectives? Is this as well applicable to academic disciplines like medicines or others? Many thanks. Well, obviously, you know, I should have warned you, you know, I'm a I'm a I'm a dumb business guy, you know, so I have my business school experiences. You know, I can talk about social sciences. I can talk about uh, I can talk about, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, other topics like journalism and, and, and all, the, all those things. Uh, yeah, there might be topics where the idea of an ecosystem is less applicable. However, we already see the approach or the attempt being done even in medical schools in Germany. In medical schools, we still have mainly a very much scholastic and academic rigorous yet far away from the patient uh, 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 model of study, which was recently broken up by Berlin Charité and by University of Heidelberg, which um, you know brought students to the patient's bed into the hospitals from their study day one on, you know, because people said, hey, you know, you need to learn how to interact with people, how to deal um, with people. So we have taken those classic, I don't know, uh, uh, three or four years of, of, of classroom sessions. You know, we've essentially dissolved them and we have created something like a modified ecosystem approach also with a lot more hospitals, obviously, that we need then with a lot more medical everyday practitioners uh, um, that we need to bring into focus. And yeah, I mean, we could also be integrating I don't know, medical device or medical technology uh, uh, leading companies or something like that. I think they'd be they'd be up for uh, for collaboration in here as well. I think even in a in a field like 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 medicine, like a medical school, we see the trend. You know, with the Charité and the University of Heidelberg approach, we see the trend uh, towards uh, uh, ecosystems. But yeah, I mean, there's certainly uh, uh, areas where this is you know, more or less extreme uh, possible. Did I lose you all right now? No, I'm here. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, no, OK, good, good, good. <laughs> um, thank you. So For next second, question. I was getting scared. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I'm still here. Uh, okay, assuming you're correct about the future vision, how do we get faculty members focused and measured on application points with you? Teaching, facilitating learning uh, and industry connections always seem to come secondary to the academic activities. How will that model flip? What can universities do now to be early and ready for that flip? I um, mean, that's exactly one of the points, you know, I mean, if you do have a system where you do build up a huge faculty and every faculty member knows that unless he's, you know, stealing silver spoons, you know, he'll be in his professorship, professorship until uh, retirement, 
you know, then obviously you have those, there's a little bit of academic incest. You know, they will always evaluate themselves on what they feel like they're comfortable with. You know, um, I think in the long run, what we will see is that the universities who are unable to bridge those gaps into industry, into real life applications, that they simply will not be so attractive anymore for industry partners, for industrial research partners, for students, which in the long run is going to cost them money. You know, so yes, we will be seeing a, a market driven uh, shakeout, but uh, that is definitely going to be a, a long bumpy road and it's, it, it's going to take a while. Okay, thank you. Here's just a comment that I'm going to read out to you. Great ideas and I agree with most of them. Nevertheless, my recent experience teaching a marketing class via Zoom teaches me two things. One, transferring to Zoom was an emergency solution. We agreed among faculty um, on that. We need True. very different formats for MOOCs. True. Two, personal contact is extremely important. I mean physical contact. The lectures were exhausted exhausting mm -hmm. for me and for students and work in group of students core learning experience via Zoom received bad rating from students themselves. Mm. So uh, there was just uh, again, I could agree with most of it, I must say. Um, yes, I also, I mean, I, I had the emergency situation, you know, uh, flipping to a digital class within what, 24 hours or so on Thursday morning, we decided to we have uh, uh, you know, the class was canceled. You know, we knew that on Wednesday night, on Thursday morning, we decided to run the class digitally. On Friday afternoon, we started teaching the class uh, using Zoom. Mm. Yes, that was an emergency solution. Yes, that is exhausting uh, for all of us. And uh, yes, I do prefer uh, physical contact. But yet again, you know, in marketing, we always talk about segmentation. And there'll be different uh, uh, different customer groups uh, for different products. And uh, if you ask me, I you know I'm a very much personal person. You know, I love to interact with people. Yeah. I love to look into people's eyes. Um, and as a student, I would love that too. However, at the same time, I see applicants at our university coming from countries like I don't know Iran, Pakistan, or. African countries or something where sometimes visa situations are difficult, where uh, uh, even if visa works, you know, cost of living in Munich is, is, is almost undoable, uh, where those targets groups are saying, hey, you know, why don't you offer your program uh, online to me? Um, uh, sure, you know, I would love to be physically at your campus, but that's at least the second best option for which I'm willing to pay. And yes, obviously, we as professors, we are then challenged to develop and to learn. And that is an ongoing learning experience for us uh, as well. You know, to we are challenged to learn and to develop new approaches to MOOCs, to digital teaching and all of that. But, you know, um, in that sense, you know, especially when I look at, at HHL or when I look at my university, I think we are two universities which have immediately without too much problem, too many problems, you know, switched our entire teaching to digital. And uh, I think that's that's something which has been a great achievement of, of the faculty. You know, uh, when we look at what we have achieved and how far we've gotten in, in three months right now, because that's, you know, pretty much the time of development right now. I mean, don't we think that we also will have a learning curve to continue in that and to improve uh, in our digital teaching and in MOOCs and in creating interaction and improving teamwork and all of the above? So, yes, I know that at the moment not everything is ideal because We've been socialized and face to face teaching for, you know, decades, but uh, uh, I believe we can take up the challenge and we can go for it. And uh, yes, you know, as much as we'll be seeing, seeing students who say, you know, I would love to go online and others who said, no, I only want to have a residential program. We might also have professors who said I will never do online or others who said, no, I don't need to do residential uh, programs because I love to live in my finca on the my Mallorca Island and, and do all my classes from there. So, you know, I, I think we'll see both. OK, thank you. Next question. Hi, Carsten. First of all, thank you. 
Do you have a view on how examinations will look like in the future? I mean, if we assume most of the education will be done remotely, mm -hmm. how is it going to be possible to make sure that students are being honest during exams? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's always a big question and I'm smiling right now because before going into, uh, into this uh, workshop right now, I was in a faculty discussion at my university and we were exactly discussing um, that kind of, of question how to run uh, examinations. Well, first of all, I must say, but that has to do with my uh, with the area where I'm teaching, you know, in marketing and strategy and leadership. You know, I'm not a big fan of, of examinations anyway. I uh, very much prefer applied work in terms of cases or projects or something like that. But I understand that there need to be uh, exams, especially when we're talking about undergraduate uh, programs. But, you know, um, that's not so far away. I mean, we already have University of Michigan, for example, has been doing uh, a, a long distance program, a digital program for many years right now in which they have sort of a front camera and a back camera uh, where they pretty much observe you while you're taking the exam, where they observe your screen also. And uh, uh, we know that a lot of, uh, uh, of those uh, collaboration platforms, Zoom being one of them, can also, uh, uh, can also be equipped with something like attention control. So for example, I'm seeing a readout uh, uh, of uh, the cameras protocoling my behavior uh, during the examination. And when, uh, for example, I'm not looking at the screen anymore, but I'm looking, you know, down here or I'm looking towards the side because I have my open script there or I'm having my body sitting next to me or something like that. Hey, you know, then there is a warning sign on the read uh, on, on, on the readout. Professors are alerted to go back and then on the back camera, I will see whether there's a, a book next to me or the way there, or where there's whether there's somebody, you know, um, sitting next to me uh, uh, in, 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 in the room. You know, I'm worried about exams in a digital age uh, anyway, you know, because I mean, just let, you know, look at smartwatches, for example, how easily, you know, students can get internet access using smartwatches and all of that. So, um, uh, yes, you know, we'll have to think about new approaches, but for that, there are specialized companies. I've been already contacted by, by, by two. Uh, um, the companies who are running those kinds of online examinations. I mean, let's not have those kinds of things stand in the way. There is a solution for everything of those details. I think the big point is we need to get this paradigm shift in our minds done that we want to fundamentally question and restructure the way how we see higher education towards leaner, more agile organizations and a stronger uh, ecosystem component. Agree, very well done, thank you. So here's the last question. When will we see the Amazon University? You mentioned Alexa knowing all of your personal preferences. Offline mm -hmm. curricula will soon be gone as printed programs for cinema mm -hmm. or linear broadcasting. Mm -hmm. Or will there be even an online, parentheses, Amazon employment agency mm -hmm. where AI matches demand and capabilities, in parentheses, preferences? I, uh, I mean, we uh, uh, we already have a lot of those online universities. We have the Udacities or something like that uh, uh, in the world. My question would be, does Amazon want to enter this field of business, which is very far away from their current uh, core competencies? Uh, do they really want to do that? If they want to get into that field, I don't think they'll develop an Amazon university uh, by themselves. You know, they'll rather be buying up a player like Udacity, for example, uh, because they have the big, big pockets uh, uh, to do so. Um, when it comes to the uh, uh, employment agency or HR consulting company, I mean, we already have, you know, AI-based systems in in uh, uh, in human resource management. We already have pre-screening of uh, uh, of 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 uh, um, CVs and all of that. Uh, all of that is happening. Yes, I mean, Amazon could become an interesting player in the market because 
my expectation is that Amazon doesn't really care about selling us, you know, books or spaghetti or toilet paper or something like that for too much longer in the future. But um, they are more and more developing into becoming the central data lake of the world uh, um, with uh, the best you know, individual or personalized knowledge of, of any other player in there. And as soon as they have that, I think they'll say, hey, you know, let's drop all the stuff left and right about retail and, and all of that. And let's con let's let, let's concentrate on on data. And then, you know, no other company will be able to live without their data anymore in order to to uh, make individualized, customized offerings. So they will naturally be partnering up with Amazon. Part of that price to Amazon will be uh, that you not only pay money, but also pay your transactional, your customer data to Amazon. And yes, you know, when then there's a uh, an HR company, a recruiting company or something like that saying, hey, I want to make use of this kind of uh, uh, of this kind of uh, uh, data uh, of individuals that Amazon is probably saying, sure, you know, we do everything for money as they're already doing right now. Um, thank you very much. I just saw there's one more comment and two more questions. So okay. here we go. First, a comment. Thank you. I liked your silver and gold approach, which integrates the physical contact. Mm -hmm. That was just a so comment. Why? <laughs> um, and here's another question. Uh, as a student, I have discussed with student colleagues of mine that, for example, online master's degrees don't feel as reliable as a normal MBA degree. Mm -hmm. What is mm -hmm. your opinion? How this type of problem will be solved in the future? Well, again, you know, uh, um, uh, think about, you know, when the uh, first automotives were uh, invented, you know, then people thought, you know, oh my God, you know, they are horribly dangerous as compared to horses or something like that. So um, whenever it's something new, whenever a brand new technology, a paradigm shift in technology comes about, I think it's very natural for us to feel that to be unreliable, less trustworthy uh, uh, than, than what we know. And quite honestly, you know, if I had the choice whether I'm active teaching or, or participating in an offline or a face-to-face -face program or a program with at least significant face-to-face -face components, I would always choose that over the entirely uh, digital program. But we have a couple of billion of people in the world and needs and expectations uh, uh, and, and media behaviors are different, you know. so. Uh, I, I think we will very soon be seeing um, such kind of digital only programs and I'm, I think I'm not saying too much if I'm saying that I'm at my university we're currently discussing how to transfer our uh, experiences of the past couple of months into uh, online programs, uh, more globalized online programs in the future. Thank you. Interesting. So here's the last question for you for tonight. Online work and collaboration is already pretty much state of the art in many businesses. Yes. Driven by, driven by globalization of services, outsourcing, outsourcing, etc. So experienced managers are typically very familiar in running their day to day via Zoom, Skype, Teams, WebEx True. or so on. So True. two questions. Do you think there will be a wave of professor dropout and replacement by lateral entrants from the industries? If so, for teaching, what happens to research? Well, first of all, uh, I don't think that is happening too soon because uh, on the one hand, the uh, the structures in and, and the regu regulation in the academic system is still too stagnant and is is just not open uh, enough for this massive influx of, uh, of lateral entrance. You know, second of all, please don't get me wrong. I've always talked about ecosystems of professors and industry people. I think both of them have a, a very important role in delivering high quality uh, higher education. And uh, because, you know, research uh, is a core principle because, you know, scientific work, because scientific methodology is a core what sets us apart as university educators from other educational institutions. You know, this is why, you know, I would never see one replacing the other uh, entirely, but rather uh, complementing e each other. I must admit that, yes, you know, uh, working online and collaborating online is very much standard stuff in the business world. I mean, you mentioned me being a part of a Silicon Valley based startup. You know, I do that a couple of times every week. 
because we have our uh, all of our meetings uh, through Zoom. You know, we often have meetings where I don't know some of our team members are sitting in the Silicon Valley, our lawyer is sitting in New York. You know, an investor is sitting in London. Uh, me and another colleague, we're sitting in Munich, but at opposite ends of town. And another colleague is sitting in Düsseldorf. You know, I mean, um, we are doing such kind of meetings uh, very regularly and much more regularly than we could ever do them, you know, if we're flying uh, back and forth. And yeah, I do believe that that might have helped a little bit also in facilitating uh, the move from face to face to to digital education that at least you know you were not afraid of this medium uh, anymore and that you knew the interaction and, and quite honestly based on my experience with students you know i normally see that students are kind of hesitant for the first hour hour and a half or something like that going newly into digital but once they've adapted to it once you've somehow gotten along as personality wise you know then you see that such things you know, work uh, uh, quite nicely. So no, I don't see a massive lateral uh, move. Uh, I see complementary experiences and skills. And, you know, I mean, that's the basis of an ecosystem. You know, that is the reason why we have an ecosystem. Otherwise, we would be replacing one static infrastructure, uh, one static structure with another static structure, uh, uh, which is, you know, full of sort of mental incest or something like that. That doesn't make sense you know so uh, 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 an ecosystem always lives off the variety of of players and the fat the multifaceted uh, uh, skill base in it thank you so so much Carsten. it was a delightful evening very inspiring so thank first you. of all a virtual round of applause um, <laughs> thank you everyone social distancing applause Mm -hmm. for all your insights for taking the time to take all those questions we really really appreciate it it was super exciting um so a great uh, applause from our end for Thank all of you who are still online just to let you know our next hhl export talk will be happening next wednesday on the 27th of may and will be on how to manage your career during COVID 19 and afterwards, we will have one on the 10th of June with Professor Chris Georg on digitization. So if you're interested in more talks, please register online. And again, many thanks to all of you. Many thanks to Carsten. Have a wonderful evening and a lovely holiday tomorrow and see you hopefully very, very soon. Bye. Thank you. Thanks a lot for bearing with me. Bye bye. <laughs> bye.